Hello to everybody. Um, but of course, this is the last session of uh, our second day of the conference, and um, well, I'm going to be speaking about um, several different things in one single lecture, and I hope that my voice is good enough so that you will just recognize what I'm talking about and. Uh, uh, I have done this recording early this morning of the second day of the conference. So I'm sorry if my voice is not good enough and I hope that everything is understandable and I really hope that you're going to be sort of enjoying this very last session of the two tiring days that we deal with jams, great jams, Greek and Roman and Byzantine jams. So let me just uh, continue. Um, before I start, I would like to make an announcement uh, and just remind you a little detail. On the program, it is indicated that I'm going to speak uh, on seven different subjects with two scholars, uh, with Dr. Mauricio Buara from Udine and with my PhD student Alev Chefinger from Izmir. Uh, but since you guys are all tired right now, I do not want to tire you more. So for that purpose, I just actually combine all of them in one single lecture so that you will just sit back and enjoy this lecture, just hearing some Turkish gems, seeing some Turkish gems, and, uh, and enjoy this two days of, of, of intensive, intensified gem symposium. So let me just continue right now. Um, Okay, the part one is a um, uh, part on a bronze ring uh, with a sphinx and amphora from Hatay, which is in southeastern Turkey. Let me show you where it is all about. Well, this is Hatay, the ancient Antioch on the Orontes. We are very lucky because this is a Turkish city on Syrian border, uh, but it belongs to us uh, since uh, 1920s. And uh, the museum in Hatay, uh, in Antioch, is very large, very rich, uh, also in terms of, um, not only in ceramics or in sculpture or sarcophagi and other things, but also for gems. Uh, but we know very little about the gem collection of Antioch. Uh, each time when I go to the, to, to the south of Turkey, to southern Turkey, uh, to Hatay and other regions, I'm very lucky because uh, I always find something to publish, to work on, and I was um, lucky enough to publish several things from this museum, very interesting things, uh, bronze lamps and bronze figurines, and then lots of sarcophagi and some inscriptions, stili, and stuff like that. So this museum is extremely rich and it's perfectly reflecting uh, the ancient antiquity and, and the ancient richness of uh, Antioch in Hellenistic Roman and early Byzantine period. And um, yeah, uh, this is also reflected in gems. Uh, I was also able to check some of those pieces. So let me come to, uh, to this uh, material. Well, this is a bronze ring with a sphinx and an emperor from Çatalhöyük. Uh, do not please confuse this Çatalhöyük with the one in central Turkey, it's a completely different one, of course, because um, uh, because this total hook is basically a less known hook from 1930s. Uh, there was an expedition over there by the Oriental Institute in Chicago, where uh, Alain Presson, uh, the uh, president of former session, is uh, acting as a professor. Uh, yeah, this is an important hook site, a tell site, a mount site. In English, we say mount, but in Turkish, it's hook. In uh, Arabic, it is tell. In uh, Persian, it's tepe. And in Greek, it's magula. Uh, this, that's an Eastern Mediterranean unit of the settlement. And uh, some excavations, well, not very intensive, but three or four campaigns were conducted by the Oriental Institute on this hook site, and they found this uh, ring, this nice, nice ring. Um, as I said, um, this, this ring has a theme with a sphinx and an amphora, which is engraved as an intaglio, and it was found in Tatalhuk, uh, as I said, it's a low-lying uh, ancient tell in northeastern part of Hatay, which is 4 kilometers 
uh, northwest of Rehan, just a river name, on the east bank of the band of Afrinche, on the borderline to Syria. So all those uh, finds are on the Syrian border, uh, which is like uh, today um, in the northwestern part of Syria, northwestern territory of Syria. One of the um, amazing landscapes that I love uh, in Syria, actually. Well, the uh, archaeological surveys and expeditions were conducted at the site by the University of Chicago's Oriental Institute from 1933 to 1935 and 36, led by Robert Braithwood and his this ring is obviously from the campaign of 1936 at Chapalut, but it is it is then forgotten this ring if it's not published and if it's published then I think the most of the publications that dated at that time are very useful but uh, they are not very deep in detail so it's an important piece. This a cusp with a round section section silver hoop is supporting an always bed basil with intaglio image of a declining female head of sphinx, amphora in front, uh, it's an arrow below, the badge of the island of Chios in the eastern Aegean, which is very close to even like 17 kilometers far from Cheshme, uh, as appears on the coinage of that island in the eastern Greek territory or in Ionia, ancient Ionia. Well, it's five grams and uh, almost 23 millimeter overall and 18 millimeter internal diameter a very small one actually but very fine condition they found it in a very fine condition about the uh, uh, fine contact we have almost no idea but i suspect it should be coming from a grave it's a funerary find this is what i'm feeling from the spine actually because most of the chatelary spines in the museum are uh, the, the ones from the Hellenic Roman and early Byzantine levels are from the graves and they're mostly intact. This is what I remember from my PhD uh, studies in 2002 that I've done in the museum. The ring should be dated to the 3rd or 2nd century BC, which is an important thing for us because we have very few Hellenistic um, rings in Asia Minor, in Turkey, so this is one of these rare finds. And uh, if we check the, uh, you know, the um, context of the spine, it is very important and we should ask the question, what is a chaotic scene does in Antioch? Uh, why the spine is from Antioch? What is the spine has to be, uh, has to do uh, here in this region? Uh, because the, uh, the region of, the, of uh, around um, Antioch was also influenced uh, by the uh, Hellenistic Greek culture a lot because it was basically the capital of Seleucid, especially in the 3rd century. Uh, and this ring is also from that period. Uh, but we had no idea about the Hellenistic culture on Intaglio and on gems or on, uh, on other um, jewelry, small jewelry at that time. So this is one of the indications of that. Let me come to the second thing which is a Roman white agata in ring with Nike from Izmir. Well, this is another map showing where Izmir is, it's right on the western territory of Turkey, right on the shore. Uh, this is where we live uh, and, you know, full with other sites around it. Uh, we have this uh, Roman ring um, uh, in, in below. Uh, it belongs to uh, today to Koray Selcik. Uh, collection in Izmir, it's a private collection, but it's an officially private collection uh, because it is registered in the um, Archaeological Museum of Izmir. So um, such collections we have a lot in Izmir, oh, around 250 private collections we have officially. These collections are belonging to the private persons, but they are being registered officially to the Museum of um, Izmir, the directorate of the Museum of Izmir, so that every year they are getting checked twice, and uh, and they can keep those items in their uh, homes or, or in their private museums. And Koray Selcuk Museum, Koray Selcuk Collection, is one of the largest, one of the best one actually. And this uh, nice ring belongs to his collection. It was formerly uh, in the collection of Bernard Ulf, uh, a, a very uh, well-known name for uh, private collection, private collectors um, in Izmir. Well, as I said, this is a bronze ring again featuring an insect, white agata, 
uh, in fact, we are winged Nike. Uh, all we know very well, personification of victory, holding an un unidentified object. Let me show it here, this one. Uh, in one hand and in another hand too, but I can't see it uh, clearly. The integral is set within a broad bezel uh, with a slight oval shape to plain shoulders and shanks. The ring has a dark green pattern, as you can see here a little bit, an extremely fine condition. It's, we are very lucky to have it actually, because um, uh, most of the rings that we have in those uh, in state collections, in architecture collections, are not as good as this one, a fine condition. They are not this, this good fine condition. Uh, Nike is pictured in the center with wings and holding an upraised and identified object. As I said, she was the personification of victory, and many people wore like her likeness on jewelry to ensure success. Such rings were particularly popular in the military, where victory was praised for ba battle successes. Besides the ornamental use of Agatha dates back to the archaic period in a sort of jewelry and in few stones of Greek warriors. So um, I believe that this ring should be second, third century AD. If, if, if we should date it more pre precisely, more closely, it should be something like between 150 to 250, so late second, early third century AD. Um, yeah. The third thing that I would like to present will be a red jasper intaglio ring with Hermes from Izmir. This is also uh, the um, the um, the uh, ring that I used for our posture, as you know. Well, this is gem by Red Casper. Uh, I'm a Red Jasper. I'm not really sure if it's Jasper. It looks like something else too. If you check it closely, it could be something else too. Uh, it's still set in a basil on an iron ring. This time we have a, we have an iron ring, but we know that iron is born continuously. It takes the appearance of silver. If you check it. It looks like silver, but it is iron, basically. Uh, certainly, the ring's owner was not a equipped, nor did he have the Eustrium uh, Liberum, uh, which would have allowed him to wear a gold ring. Uh, so that's something um, like an imitation of gold ring at that time. But it's basically by a cheaper metal. On the gem, there is a representation of Hermes Mercury with Pegasus standing to the right. With the left raised, he holds the bag, the very typical one, as all we know very well. And while with the right extended forward, he holds the Kadeku. The raised left holds the bag, while the ring stretched forward holds the Kadeku. It is made by two parallel lines in a different way, as you see. I mean, I mean the Kadeku here. Two different lights, this one, this, and this one, this, and then that one. Um, <clears throat> uh, in a different way from what appears in italic gems, where the catechus can be rendered with a square termination, the ground line appears. In the composition, there is a chastic scheme of classical reminiscence, in our case, Luzupium. If you if check it, the form is Luzupium, very typical. If the iconographic shame is well known, the execution reveals a certain sophistication typical of what is normally defined as provincial art. Not the rendering of the face and arms. The legs are reduced to two straight trunks. In fact, those with similar stylistic characteristics were found in an area very far from Anatolia in the Simpson treasure which, about which Martin Hennig wrote the table to the central decade of the 2nd century AD. It seems likely that our gem was made by an Antolium Gemarius. The depiction of Mercury is amongst the most frequent in the gems of both Rome and the provinces. It can be assumed that the owner was a merchant, or in any case, a person who carried out productive activities connected with earrings. Often the depictions of Mercury appear on red jasper gems, so it should be again dated to the last decade of the second and early first century half of the First century, uh, third century AD, the uh, the uh, ring, uh, and it's again in the private collection of uh, Korai Sachik, but it was formula formula belonging to Berna, Berna's collection here in Izmir, in a nice piece actually. Well, the uh, other thing that I would like to present in, in part four is a leaves on Oriental plain chenar, 
you say Chennai in Turkish, on Roman reigns, meaning inter interpretation. Well, in the Archaeological Museum of Izmir that we publish, there is a golden ring featuring an Agatha Intaglia of the Elbe of the Oriental Plain, Chennai. Um, the measurement is like the width is 6 mm, length is 8 mm, and diameter is 8 mm. The intaglio is set within a broad basal with a slight oval shape to plain shoulders and chain. It's an extremely fine condition. Uh, and if you check it, uh, you can see it very clearly how um, pe uh, talently they just carved this intaglio on the ring. As you see, and it's uh, one of the rare things that we have in Turkey, uh, that type of leaves. If I check uh, how many leaves we have, we have very few ones, uh, very few intact with leaves, and the most common leaf type is chinar. So we um, are trying to find an explanation for that, why they did prefer chinar for uh, the rings at that time, for the intaglio. The other thing that I would like to present is a gemstone with the name Yesu from Izmir. Well, this is basically this one, the one which is being published in this abstract book with all of you have seen it. Uh, this is an octagonal shaped gem in place, is placed on a silver ring, in the, again in a private collection in Izmir, to which it is tied with a golden band. Here you can see clearly the golden band. And then nice uh, fingering with this octagonal shape gem. Very nice cutting actually. Uh, the octagonal shape is well known in the period between the second and fourth fifth centuries AD. At least fifteen are known in Europe. In late antiquity, the octagonal shape reappeared also in relation to the name of Jesus, as a ring, uh, as in a ring from the, a private collection reproduced on the website of the University of Oxford. Gems of this shape can have both pagan and Christian figures. During the excavations conducted in the 1960s in Gordium, nine rings with gems were found, three of which are octagonal in shape. By associating this data with other findings from Asia Minor, we can assume that a workshop existed in central Anatolia that worked for both pagans and Christians. There is an article about that by Andrew Goldman. Uh, he's supposed to be here actually, he just uh, expressed some interest about our conference, but he didn't appear eventually. Uh, he published in Anatolian Studies uh, in 10 years ago or something about uh, those um, octagonal shaped uh, gems, mostly based on the material from Gordian. It's a very interesting and very useful article actually. In our case, on the gem's surface appears the description with the name of the owner, Yesu, in Greek letters, in two lines connected to each other by the letter C, I mean, but lunate C, sigma. Uh, we would be driven to understand the name of Jesus as an allusion to Jesus Christ, but in ancient times, Jesus was a very common proper name in the Hebrew context. As today, for instance, we as Muslims, we do um, use, for instance, Muhammad, a lot of Muhammad, especially in Europe, it's the same, Not, none of them are the prophet, but the prophet name used by, uh, you know, usual people. It is by frequency the sixth among the names attested by historical sources for the Jewish people. The fact that it's written in Greek letter seems to mean that the ring belongs to a Hellenized Jew. The inscription does not appear well taken care of. Lunate sigma is very common at that time, especially in these centuries in the late antiquity. Among the earliest Christian gems, the table to the mid 3rd century AD, are a number of small carnations and jaspers engraved on with inscriptions naming or referring to Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus Christ appears in some gems, for example, in the initials Jesus Christus Sota Christus. The, uh, in uh, in say in uh, corpus inscriptum Greek. Other times the formula is Jesus Christus Jesus Theu as in a gym from the British Museum, uh, possibly from Constanza uh, in Romania. Okay, this is our ring. Very lovely a combination of gold, a little bit silver, and a nice gym on there. And you can clearly see the uh, East Park 
the in star form. Uh, well, let me show you here. Uh, in the middle, you can see more or less a little bit Jewish influence. Good. Uh, our uh, part six is about a silver ring with ten talpas from Izmir. In the private collection of Mr. Uh, Mr. Koray Salskin Izmirli, formerly in the private collection of uh, Mrs. Bernal, uh, there is a silver ring with a bezel where a pentagram is engraved. The image of the pentagram or pentalpha or pentacle or pentacle can take a, on a plurality of meanings. Some of these are related to religious beliefs or magical rituals. Pentalpha or pentagram was a popular device on finger ring. Modern rings with representation are still in circulation today, presumably deprived of their original meaning. In our ring, the old pagan beliefs, that five stars, are incorporated into the world of uh, the medieval Christian. The pentagram sh uh, symbol has also been interpreted as evangelic sign of the Apostle Luke or a symbol of the Holy Virgin herself. We know such rings from Sardis, a late Roman or early Byzantine time, or Corinth uh, in uh, 2010, or the day uh, Zoroba studied 28 medieval rings of the Balkan Peninsula with this symbol. Subsequently, uh, Dayan Georgioski deals with the topic with the reference to the territory of the Republic of Macedonia. Georgioski himself recalled a manuscript entitled The Detachment of Solomon, uh, published in 19, uh, 1922 in McCrown in Chicago in which the other describes the ring of Solomon with the representation of the pentagram, which allowed him to command the demons. Perhaps the reference uh, to Solomon is one of the saving elements that has fa favored the survival of the symbol for many centuries. Some of these rings found in Ephesus date, uh, have been dated by Andrea Putz in her Legends of Work, late Legends book on the bronze from Ephesus to the 9th to 10th century. They appear very close in types of engraving and in the shape of basil to our ring, which we would like to date to that period as well. So it's basically in late um, uh, ring, uh, actually very rare in um, uh, this symbol in West Major Minor, because most of the time when I work on finger rings here in Izmir, I work on several, several, several hundreds of rings here in Izmir, bronze rings especially, and sometimes uh, copper rings, uh, I can tell you the most of the finds that we deal here are from late antique, early Byzantine period, in a period between uh, late 4th to uh, early 7th or mid 7th century, sometimes up to 18th century. And that's the most common period for the rings here in Western Asia Minor. And unfortunately, we have no corpus of these rings, and I definitely need a PhD student uh, who will help me for studying those rings here in Izmir with lots of intaglio and other um, uh, other type of engravings on those rings because we have lots of lots of signs here in Izmir. Now the last part is about Turkish contact phase of Roman gems. Uh, with Dr. Maurice Bora we have studied uh, some counterfeits, uh, some fake items in Turkey. And um, we uh, finished our article, we completed our study and sent it to uh, the publisher. So it's going to be appearing soon. And I will send you, of course, a copy of it. And hopefully, inshallah, you will all read it and hopefully you will like it or you will hate it. I don't know. <laughs> Let me see. Uh, well, in the uh, web page of Turkish Ministry of Culture and Tourism, uh, uh, there is a very, very useful uh, page about fake items in Turkish museums, and I just copied an um, image from there. It's one of the very few uh, images where they indicated gems on their website. There are several material gems there, not only uh, gems, but there are also sculpture, there are also uh, cuneiform tablets, coins and figurines, glass material, uh, jewelry, and other things. But uh, they have few gems, and I was especially interested in fake gems in Turkish museums, in Turkish markets, antiquities markets, to find out how did they manage to copy Roman gems in Turkey, what, they, what did they do, how did they do, when did they do, and who did the things here. 
and how come and, and for which purpose? So these were the questions that I would like to reply uh, in my study. So far, no attention has been given to modern gems present in Turkish uh, state museum collections. There are not to be considered absolutely counterfeit, but rather the expression of internationally widespread fashion throughout the 19th century and even after. Therefore, they tend to products imported from Europe to be part of some collection or initially intended for personal adornment. We can also think of possible import from Venice, uh, famous for this kind of artistic products and were very well known connected to the ports of Aegean Sea. Generally, common characters of modern gems are large size, oval shape, and rounded edge. So these are not really professional counterfeits. They are more, I would say, for touristic purposes, as we say, because of their large size, larger than usual, and the oval shape, and the rounded edge, edges. Sometimes the iconography of ancient subjects is well reproduced, as in the case of Corninium with Minerva, where, however, the relief parts are a little swollen and summery. A gem in opaque green glass seems to present a three-quarter portrait of a young man which, uh, with thick locks of hair and enlarged nose and parted lips. This one here, right on the corner, as you can see, this one. Nice one, actually. The bead found at the base of the neck is common in modern manufacturing. A probable athlete, which is here, this one, this one actually, um, make it with hair tied on his head, Kirkus, uh, Kirkus, is placed frontally with his head bent to the right. From his left hand, resting on a column, hangs a strigil. The unusual crossing of the legs allows us to understand that we are outside classical art. Another Corninian represents a portrait, somehow inspired by the representation of Faustina. Her hair, however, is arranged in very linear and cursive bands. Okay, thank you very much for listening to my lecture and thank you very much for uh, being a part of this conference for the last three, two days. We are all tired right now. and. Uh, uh, but I think that we had a very good result with all the papers and I'm hoping so much that you will guys send me your papers soon so that we will include them in a final publication and send to a publisher in Germany, in Münster and hopefully, uh, hopefully, hopefully it will publish soon in two years or three years, hopefully, inshallah, I say because as all of you know, all of you know very well uh, the type of proceedings uh, and their uh, proper edition takes so much time. So please, please show me some patience for this element so that I will just really sit down and work on the proceedings uh, carefully. Uh, because editions are the most important part of the uh, of the conference director, of the congresses. Uh, and I would like to announce our next year uh, symposium, which is about which is going to be about stabilizing. Uh, because I checked in the internet and I didn't come to the conclusion that there was any Stibuli conference so far. Uh, their few organization have been done so far and the next year we will concentrate on Stibuli in anywhere in the Mediterranean. It's going to be an international e-conference again in honor of Dr. Mauricio Bora, a name who really dealt with this subject for the last 40 years. So thank you very much again to be a part and see you next year as well. Goodbye. Well, thank you very much for that detailed presentation. There's been a very lively chat going on uh, and I hope that uh, if that people will uh, like to continue to discuss this as we enjoy the view of your sunset. Uh, and can you hear me at all there? Can you hear yes, me, Ergen? Yes, that's perfect. Ergen, where you are, can you hear? Are you going to be able to answer any questions? OK. Um, he said he was having some difficulty hearing on the, uh, the roof of his building. Uh, so I'm hoping that he'll be able to participate in the chat. Uh, but let's just scroll back up here. Um, there have been quite a lot of um, topics, including what, how, to, how 
much did gemstones cost, which was sort of a, there are some general questions here like that, as well as specific ones about the objects. And I wonder if anybody else would like to chime in on the uh, on topic. Um, so let's see. <laughs> uh, so you can see that um, the beginning, it, it, uh, sparked a discussion uh, where Karina was mentioning that she thought the figure was nemesis. And um, do you want to comment on that at all? Karina, do you want to comment on that? Um, Any further? Sorry, sorry. No, but it's very obviously that she pulls her her garment, her, her kiton, and she spits into it and what she holds in her hands must be the famous reins or bridles. Okay. Was well, not could... only by me, but also by Elisabetta and, and others. I think that could be a clear thing. The first ring, unfortunately, we saw it the upside down, uh, the Sphinx with the Amphora. Uh, but I published uh, some years ago a very similar ring with another stone. Uh, but the form was very similar, can send that in. Very good. Okay, thank you. Um, then we have had, um, we've had some other specific questions about the paper, but also some general questions about um, gems and rings here. And uh, Nancy Serwin asked about whether rings were made to order to fit a specific finger. And I chimed in with some observations based on my own studies of, of rings and burials where I've found that the band has been cut and widened, mm -hmm. um, but also bands cut and squeezed. Yeah. And I wonder whether anybody else would like to comment on this topic of whether rings were made to order to fit specific fingers. Oh, if I may, um, I'd like to comment a little bit about this topic. I think I remember once reading something in Pliny uh, when he was, where he stated that the Romans used to wear fingers, like um, several fingers on one finger. So it could be that the smaller ones were even used at the top. Yes. So it's not probably yes. children or yeah. very small women, but also could be also for males with very thin fingers and because this is a very small area. So again, I was very curious, maybe if you have found in some uh, tombs or graves in burials, uh, rings that were placed on the upper side of the hands and not really closer to the, the, of the fingers and not close to the hands, maybe to, I don't know, to, um, to, to clearly say that Pliny was not wrong in saying that. Yeah, yes. Um, uh, yeah. The Smithsham Roman jewellers board ha had uh, a lot of um, of rings that are partly made up. They've just haven't quite set the gems, and these seem to have been made ready for for ready sale. Now I'm sure that sometimes they uh, they made rings specifically, or as nowadays you could get a ring modified, but they were but there were also a lot of rings which you could probably just go and try on. I think it's very interesting when you have what is in fact a jeweler's stock in trade, things he was just about to sell. And we don't know quite why he buried them in a pot, but they were, the, the rings were, were very, very nearly complete. The, they just needed to smooth down the area around the gemstone. Thank you. Yeah, so this is interesting thinking about, you know, specific people in relationship to these objects that we have been talking about during this conference. Um, another question was whether rings were actually made for wearing or they were simply for decoration. And again, I chimed in with a few comments based on my observations and burials. Uh, where it's very clear that some people really did wear the rings on their uh, fingers. And I did find some patterns about decorated and undecorated rings on different hands. Uh, also, um, some evidence having to do with uh, gender 
more women wearing rings and at least Bronze Age burials, um, but also rings that were worn on necklaces and rings found in other areas of the burial um, where maybe they were deposited as part of a group of objects, not particularly on the body. Uh, so maybe other people would like to chime in on that topic. Or not. <laughs> um, okay, then we had another um, comment based on his paper um, about Hermes possibly being Cupid. Um, and then down here, I think there was another, let's see, Right, and then another person saying uh, about Cupid burning a Psyche uh, butterfly. Does anybody wish to comment on that topic? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, it's us. It's, us. <laughs> it's, it's you, okay, great. Oh, yeah. um, uh, that, that, I mean, it's, 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 it's a very interesting scene. I should actually mention uh, that my friend uh, Verity Platt has published uh, an article on burning butterflies. She put it in, 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 in a festival, but she's put it, I think, freely online. That's right. Uh, and, and, and that's worth looking at. But this looked clearly like that. It's, a, it's, quite, a, it, it's, it's quite a late example. Mm -hmm. I quite agree it's third Very century. It's, it, it's later than anything in Snettersham, uh, which, which were all of Cornelian and a mid second century. This, this is very much getting towards uh, a third century uh, form with the, uh, with, 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 with a high, with the, the gem rising well above the bezel. So I, I would date it to the third century. And, mm -hmm. but it, it, I don't know that the gem cutter quite realized what he was doing, but it seems to me that this is quite clearly um, Eros, as we call him, uh, burning the butterfly, which is uh, a device that goes right back and a very common Roman device. Mm. About the wearing of rings, um, Martin just reminded us of one of our graduate students who wrote her doctorate thesis um, analyzing um, uh, who was wearing what in one of the caves um, ah. uh, where um, you had uh, this huge group of people uh, dying uh, in the eruption of um, Vesuvius. And she interestingly found that it's mainly the younger women who were still wearing their jewelry. Interesting. Everyone who was slightly older <laughs> thought, oh my God, let's get out of here. I'm not going to be bothered to put on. Oh, that's jewelry. fascinating. But possibly she also thought um, that it meant uh, that it's more important for younger females to attract a male to look very beautiful, or possibly mm. they're more vain for other reasons. Um, Interesting. So in Pompeii, um, in the cave, when you can actually find out who is um, the person, if it's a, a female, a male, it's it's the younger females. Um, yeah. And, 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 and we also have uh, evidence, I mean, uh, one of the, the ones that goes back to a previous lecture, but it's quite interesting. It's, it's a lovely gold ring with a, a garnet in it, with um, uh, with, with, with a head of, 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 of an actor or something just like that. It was found uh, in a, a fort at, at Housestead, the very first deposit of a fort, which was founded by Hadrian, uh, and it was probably worn by a woman and it was dropped down uh, his latrine. But the interesting thing is that at that fort, the only person who could officially be married what would be the, com the commander of the fort. So we rather think that this is the commander's wife in, 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 in their, their private latrine, dropping a gold ring down the... <laughs> Wow, <laughs> leaving it for us to find. <laughs> That's great. I can add, if I may, uh, that there is a famous uh, photograph. I um, searched for it in my files, but I didn't find it. Um, taken uh, uh, on the beach of uh, Herculaneum, and uh, there is uh, the skeleton of a lady wearing uh, two different finger rings, uh, 
on uh, the same uh, finger um on not at the base of the finger here and uh, when you compare the gems there is a span or at, at least one century be between uh, one and the other one so uh fund camera are always very very important uh, because uh, they do explain a lot of uh, details we cannot understand just uh, studying them in museums and collections yes indeed we had another general question and that was about the cost of gemstones and i know that i've read about that but i don't have that information right at the top of my head um, so if anybody has any um, thoughts on that question no and then i've I asked a question about the shape of the <coughs> ring of the hoop, actually, for the octagonal, octagonal gem that he showed. Um, and I wondered whether it dated to the late antique period because it was similar to the sh shape of the unusual hoop that I showed for the um, Gnostic gem from uh, Limni on Cyprus. And that led into a discussion about the shape of these things and whether it could have to do with baptistries or something else and uh, seemingly not Baptist baptistries. Um, so an interesting, you know, set of chat uh, aspects in the chat about that topic. Uh, uh, Joanna? Yeah, I... please chime in. <laughs> I'm just trying um, to make sure everybody's aware of the, the yeah. various discussions and uh, um, any input there as well. There are many, many items collected by Gabriella Tassinari in her um, interesting article about the, uh, I think it's the mouse. Uh, she wrote uh, something and there are many of these octagonal uh, things. Are also um, in other collections imperial uh, busts on it. Um, so I was dealing with these rings for my Huntsman collection, and I thought the same you did that it could be a sign of that baptisterium. But then I thought it emerges in the pagan thing already, the octagonal. It could have been taken over by the Christians and have that they have made a combination to their uh, um, baptisterials, but from the origin, it is pagan. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I Thank would you. like to add that uh, I recently reorganized the ecliptic collection of the, the National Archaeological Museum in Aquileia, uh, which means 8,000 8,000 gems, wow. and uh, I have uh, just one uh, gem of this kind of octagonal, uh, a, a trunk of an uh, octagonal pyramid, only one uh, mm, with a pagan mm. device. So uh, it is very strange because uh, all of the gems uh, uh, in the Aquila collection come from uh, uh, the ancient site of Aquileia, so they are not from collection, they are not exactly from Kevin because uh, of most of them, we don't know exactly the context, but uh, uh, at least uh, on in that place, uh, they were not in vogue in, uh, in in any time because we have the complete uh, range range of time, uh, second century uh, BC, third uh, AD. Thank you. Thank you. So in the last topic that was raised in the chat, in addition to the many thanks and appreciations for the conference and the organizers, um, is that um, Meli has asked about the uh, the symbolism of rings and the passing on of these from uh, one person to another. Uh, and he likens this to the Lord of the Rings. Um, and I have definitely found this to be the case in my research um, with uh, Bronze Age seals, the value and the, the passing on. And I've found it interesting that older gems are cut again or redesigned in some way. Mm. And I wonder if anybody else would like to chime in on his comment about the, um, the value of these objects.
Okay. Well, if not, then... Um, yes, Martin wants to say something. Oh, okay. Sorry. I think that one very interesting thing about gems, which hasn't been, I think, mentioned, is the way that they get reused, uh, at least in the West, uh, uh, in the Middle Ages. Indeed, they were imported from the East um, during the Middle Ages, and, uh, and, and in Britain, France, Germany, I, I, I know all, all, also in Hungary, where some have been published, uh, you get uh, medieval seals and medieval rings, which contain ancient gems. Yes. It's a whole, yes. It's a whole subject yes. by itself, but these things continue to be valued. And furthermore, um, uh, new gems were cut at this time as well. So you get me medieval uh, gems uh, cut in the same way mm. on Cornelian and on other stones. And it's a, it, it's a fascinating story it about is. the continuity of these. Yes, reliquaries having yeah. gems, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I've often thought of some of the Iron Age things as being akin in some ways to reliquaries of Bronze Age objects. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. And don't we know that when Evans uh, tried to buy more of these seals around Knossos when he was wondering um, about, um, the uh, women wouldn't actually sell them to him because mm. they thought that they had this magic property um, of um, helping with the lactation, that they wouldn't be able to nurse their babies. Mm. They gave away their milk stone. So That's you know, right. This whole new Greek magic, uh, which was um, suddenly inflicted um, on these items and only a lot of money meant uh, that, you know, he was able to buy them. Yes. Great. So let's see. Um, I think we've reached our the end of the conference. It's a fascinating chat here at the end, and I wish we could all hang out and uh, have further discussion on the roof of this marvelous <laughs> this marvelous roof um but i think that um what ergun would like to do is he's got his hand raised i actually also see anna has her hand raised um do you want to try to talk ergun can you um i i just want to say something about the reusing of the gems in the middle oh, okay ages. please in romania so they started to dig up uh, in the Middle Ages, in the Roman city, because they they uh, or they uh, could see the Ro the Roman ruins, so they dig up and they reuse the Roman gems. Uh, probably they found also objects from gold or uh, I don't know precious metals, but they had laws in the Kingdom of Hungary. So if they uh, uh, find out, uh, I don't know that someone could. Uh, um, stole this gold from the king they were hanged so uh, when they uh, find gold they uh, melt it um, but the gems uh, they uh, uh, sell it uh, to the higher bidder of course and sometimes even uh, even local nobles uh, could uh, um, um, had uh, something like this could uh, um, excavate Eight Roman ruins, and after that, in the 19th and in the uh, even in the 20th uh, uh, 20th cycle, um, they also uh, excavate Roman city uh, to find such thing. So we have many many items, uh, uh, many gems reused in the medieval or even in modern um, uh, rings in the collection of the Romania. But um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Until now, we uh, haven't published yet. <laughs> many of this, uh, this wonder. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So um, Ergun seems to have temporarily left his seat, but what he wanted me to do here at the end was to um, extend a thank you to his uh, fellow uh, organizers, especially to Millie, who has so kindly um, organized all of these presentations and uh, received things as people have sent them in and and uh, done some troubleshooting along the way. Um, so let's see here. I'm a little unclear on whether I'm to bring this to a close. <laughs> um, if there are any further comments, though, um, 
please raise them or type them into the chat. And uh, we'll give them a minute to come back. <laughs> But I think, I think what I'd like to do is thank everybody very much for participating in this conference and participating in this lively chat. And then I'm going to hand it off. Ergun, do you want to say something here at the very end? <clears throat> I think we're finishing the, uh, the discussion. Well, maybe why don't you say something at the, at the very end? Because uh, because here is like really noisy. Mili, are you there? How about how about you speaking better than myself? I see Anna is actually on the move. <laughs> um, okay. Well, um, okay. Go ahead. Um. Do you hear me now? I think you hear yes. me now. Yeah, uh, I would like to thank you, each one of you, for joining this uh, uh, symposium. I try to help you as much as I can, uh, even though I have to lecture a little bit uh, from two to five. And uh, I, I really would like to uh, thank you, all of you. And um, I hope we will meet in the next year. And uh, until then, yeah, thank you. Until then, uh, uh, thank you for joining again and uh, please stay healthy in these dire times and uh, yeah yes thank you very much thank you yeah thank you very much so i think we will uh, officially close our wonderful conference goodbye <laughs> <laughs>